Hello everyone, welcome to the Abnormies podcast. Joining me as always is Branda. What's happening, brother? Howdy, howdy. howdy. You good? It's all good. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm, uh, I've con- conquered co- COVID, so uh, I feel very manly. It's good. Oh, my voice, up. my voice is still recovering a bit, but you know. Yeah, man. It's good to hear. Good to hear. Well, uh, good to hear that you're recovering. Uh, yeah. On that note, we also have a guest. Uh, we have Paul from the Tune Review YouTube channel, who is also uh, suffering from COVID. What's happening, man? I'm all right, Sai. Si. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm the only yeah, one good. who's virus yeah. free out of us. Well, so. Yeah, well, the cool yeah. kids. You, you know, it's yeah. the fashion today. It is. Yeah, that's Definitely. COVID. You're like, you know, <laughs> yeah. I had it. I had it in the early days, um, but I was I was fine. Because I'm before it was cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's cool now. It's cool now to have it. Yeah, if, if you haven't had it, you're not cool. Yeah, no. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm no. definitely not cool. Um, yeah, so Paul is joining us. Paul, um, just to introduce him, I'll let him introduce himself. But briefly, uh, he runs a YouTube channel called The Tune Review, which is a Newcastle United best team in the world. It is a fan channel on YouTube. Uh, Paul is on the Abnormies podcast as he suffers from Parkinson's. Um, so we thought what a great guest to have on who could be someone who is has this, this disorder, this disease, um, and has now transitioned to working full-time as a YouTuber um, with this disability. So we thought what a great guest would fit in perfectly with what we are doing on the Abnormies podcast. So Paul... Um, do you want to introduce yourself? Who are you? Where are you from? What's the meaning of life? Over to you, mate. <laughs> the meaning of life. Um, well, uh, like you say, I run a, a YouTube channel. Um, I've I've done it now for around, well, full time. I've done it for around eight months or so now. Um, I had, uh, obviously, as you just said there, I got uh, diagnosed with Parkinson's, uh, I think 2015, early 2016, um, when I was only uh 38 year old or something so it came as a hell of a shock uh turned my life upside down um lost obviously couldn't work anymore um didn't really have any direction didn't really know which way I was going or what I wanted to do after that um I live in uh I live in Durham uh I've been in Durham most of my life apart from a little stint in South Shields um and uh yeah like you say I've become a full-time YouTuber because um well, it was something I was passionate about. Obviously, Newcastle United, as you well know, um, it was something I I love talking about. Getting quite uh, passionate, shall we say, from time to time on the, on the podcast. But uh, it, it just grew. Um, it started g- getting a lot of attention. Um, you know, I just hit over eight thousand subscribers over the weekend, so that was uh, that was great for me. Um, but I've actually got a lot of people who work backstage, you know, my fiance does a lot of the designing for logos, etc. Uh, she's doing um, designing for merchandise now, which I never thought would come around. I've got people behind the scenes um, as moderators for, for the chat during live shows. Um, I really, you know, I mean, I, it was, it was just something I just started doing because I was just recording on my phone um, and then just putting it up on the YouTube. But then as it slowly got bigger and bigger, I, I then had to, buy all the equipment, cameras, lighting, and uh, a good enough computer kind of thing. And um, yeah, it was it's something that I'm really passionate about because it just proves that if you get knocked back with a, an illness, uh, it's not the end of the road. Um, you know, I, I could have... Yeah, I, I did hit rock bottom, I must admit. I, you know, my marriage broke down and um, I had a lot to deal with. Uh, three months after that, I got uh, diagnosed with uh, diabetes as well, type 1. So... Um, Shit. I had to start injecting every day. Um, so it just wasn't an easy time. So I, d- I did hit rock bottom. Um, mm. I didn't see a way out. I thought, you know, it, it just really depressed and thought, Christ, is this what my life's become? I've worked every day, um, played ice hockey for, you know, all my teenage years and uh, 20s and stuff. And then um, to sort of be hit with this stigma, it was it was difficult for me. I didn't see a way out, but then slowly you start to see that it's not the end of the world just because you have an illness doesn't mean you can't do certain things um for me i'm i guess i'm lucky Sai, because the the medication is a lot different now to what it used to be so when i was first diagnosed i was thinking of like you know muhammad ali and all that and, and the and how he got in later life it's nothing like that now you know you can control it with medication 
Uh, my tremors are controlled really well. Can't do anything about the pain that goes with it or the, you know, the, the headaches, et cetera. You have to live with that. But at the same time, it's not as restrictive as it used to be. Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. Um, I, so I get, we'll get more into the, into the, into the, the Parkinson's itself uh, later on in the episode. Yeah. I know Brandas, um, I don't know if he's an expert, but he's quite knowledgeable on uh, lots of neurological uh, disorders. Um was training to be an astrobiologist or wanting wow. that was his goal before um, paralysis struck. Just uh, something um, I, I say to get chicks. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what uh, we'll it start work. from? <laughs> we'll start Paul, from what, what you were doing um, before, so pre Parkinson's. Yep. What was what was life? You mentioned ice hockey. Um, yeah. What what, what, what so were you, you were doing? athletic? What, yeah. What, what was your path before pre Parkinson's? Um, well, teenagers, growing up, uh, it was ice hockey. It was it was always ice hockey. It was, you know, it, it kind of took over my life. Um, playing as a, a young kid at Durham and sort of moving up the ranks, and then uh, you know, playing for England, Great Britain, and, and getting to the the, wow. the, the big levels. And um, cool. and, and then when Durham shut down, um, I, I made the move to Whitley Bay, which was like. Sunderland and Newcastle, if you like, or the other way around. Um, mm-hmm. So it was difficult to be accepted by the the Whitley fans when I first went there. Um, but slowly but surely, they came around to the fact that, you know, uh, they realised that I wasn't a Mackham, which was a, a big thing for me. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so, it, you know, growing up, it was it was very important sport. Uh, you know, I was training um, literally every day. Uh, it, was, it was full on, uh, especially when I sort of got into my 20s. Um, but I also worked, um, you know, there was a short time where I was sort of just, it was just the ice hockey, but, um, I worked for, uh, EE for a long time, um, as a, as a team manager there. Um, the final job I had was, um, at, um, uh, North Tyneside Council as a, uh, working in the, um, well, I started working in the call center and then slowly worked my way up there and, uh, head of children's services and then, uh, bang, it got taken away from me. So uh, mm-hmm. it was a great job, it, but it was very, very stressful. You can obviously imagine um, the stuff that went on there um, and that you had to see and hear about. And uh, um, but it was it was a job I was really proud of, and I was doing really well. Um, but that was kind of what my life was. It was the ice hockey, but that got that got taken away from me as well because uh, I had a nasty injury where I uh, um, mid twenties um, got a smashed my jaw um, completely. Um, which had to be pinned and metal plates put in and everything like that. So the whole Shit. sort of right hand side of my face is literally made up of metal. Um, so I wasn't cool. excited. Yeah. Well, basically Robocop. Yeah, I got I got yeah. that a few times. Yeah, um, but it was uh, it, it was hard to to give that sport up when you played it since you were like six year old. Yeah. Um, you know having that taken away but I couldn't take the risk you know what I mean it was um the I did go back and try and play um and I just remember uh playing away down in Sheffield one of my first games back after being injured um and obviously everybody knows you know what kind of injury you've come back from you kind of get targeted um and I just remember take this this lad came and give us a massive body check and um you know had obviously a jaw guard on and everything and me my helmet went flying off, and I just remember it was like everything just went silent. Um, it, it was just me, and I looked over at my coach, and he sort of just shook his head, and yeah. I nodded as if to acknowledge that that was it. And I just skated yeah. off the ice and then never went back. Um, yeah, it was it was been... one of them surreal moments. Yeah, that must have been yeah. um, a devastating blow to have something like that uh, mm. taken away from you when it's been yeah. your lifelong passion. I wonder, can I ask, because I, I used to do basketball, uh, you know, for a long time. Never, never fully pro like you, but, uh, but I stuck with it for a long time. And, and I always thought that when I became sick, like the, the lessons and the training and all of that really helped me kind of deal with uh, my new situation. So I mm-hmm. wonder if you relate to that, how sports prepared you for your illness. Uh in a way, it did. Um, I mean, obviously, there was a there was a few years, you know, from me playing until I got diagnosed with uh, with the with the illness. But I guess um, 
it's a very disciplined sport. Uh, you know, everybody sees you go on the ice and it's it's all this rough and tumble stuff. But it's there's a lot of technical side to, to, to ice hockey. It's not all just rough and tumble. Um, there's a lot of discipline involved in it as well. Um, and I had some great coaches over the years who, uh, I guess from a young age, you know, having them coaches in your life are like sort of parents to you because you, you, you're involved with them that much. You probably yeah. see your coaches more than you do your own family. Um, and some of the coaches that I had from a very early age were very, very, very strict, um, very tough because they used to play, uh, especially at Durham. It was just uh, Durham, you had, to, you had to be born a winner. You know, D- Durham had a reputation of being one of the, the best teams in the UK. So, you, you know, these guys were very, very disciplined when they went into coaching, especially the kids. You know, they used uh-huh. to get very annoyed with you and you used to think as a kid, my God, but, you know, once you've grown up and you mature and you realize um, the guidance that they did give you um, wasn't just for the ice hockey. It was, it was for later life. Um, and, yeah. and certainly, um, you know, it has helped because I, I look back and I think of the things that I was told, not just on the ice, but off it. Um, and it, it yeah, I, it, I, it did help. Yeah. I think for me, it was a lot about that, uh, you know, push harder. You know, you mm. come to that point where you start thinking, okay, that's it. I'm tired. I can't do any more. And then your coach comes in and says, yeah. what, you taste blood? Well, all right. That means, mm-hmm. you know, that means it's working. Keep going. Yeah. I mean, I had some, I had some hell on earth injuries playing ice hockey, but I would, I would, I would do it all again in a, in an absolute shock. Um, yeah. You know, I've had broken ribs. I've had, um, I've got scars all over from when I was, um, you know, I've got my wrist all metal pinned up and, and everything like that as well. Um, some horrendous injuries, but you, you know, you expect that when you play a sport like that. But um, if anything, it taught me camaraderie, um, you know, being a, a family. But when you talk about sort of getting back up on your feet and not, and not accepting defeat kind of thing, um, that's what happened to me. You know, when I was, when I was at my lowest, um, it was kind of an, epiphany if you like um my dad always used to say you know you you know you've been dealt this but you've you know you've got you can do other things you know and it's uh, it's not the end of the world and I used to think yeah you're just saying that but he was right and then I would look back to everything that I was told you know even as a young kid you know when you used to take a big body check and you used to go down on the ice and you used to everybody used to say right come on get up get up get up and and that's the kind of things that you used to hear you know and, and when um when I was rock bottom, um, you know, I, I mean, it, it sort of takes me into this, if you like. I um, There was one night I distinctly remember sitting downstairs at the dining table with a load of tablets in front of me um, at my rock bottom lowest. But it was them voices, and obviously my kids as well, I, you know, they, they played a big part in uh, keeping me going. But those voices in my head saying, you know, you can do this. It's not the end. Get up get some sort of life back, you can do it. Um, So yeah, it did. It did really help because you you hear them voices. And I suppose when you've played for that long, you will always hear them voices, no matter how old you are. You'll always look back at that advice you were given. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, man. So going on to the Parkinson's then, um, but before before that, obviously you said you had injuries... um, with ice hockey in the past in your twenties, so you are saying you are thirty eight. So, what what did you first notice? Um, how did it first um, appear? The symptoms? Um, were, were you healthy um, before that? And then, so it kind of how did it how did it enter your life? Um, I was relatively healthy. I mean, you know, I I wasn't as sort of fit and healthy as I was when I was uh, playing hockey, obviously, because. <laughs> You know, I was uh, I was on the ice every day, so it didn't matter what I ate. You know, I could burn it off the same night. You know, so it, it never used to bother me. But uh, you know, w- once you quit playing and you try and eat the same sort of foods, it doesn't work like that anymore. Yeah. Um, but the main problem I had was I was fatigued, very fatigued during the day, and that wasn't like me. Um, I felt this yeah. overwhelming tiredness when I was sort of sitting at my desk at work, um, and then one day. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, a fellow manager, was sitting next to me, uh, Mike, and he looked over and said, do you realise your right hand's shaking? Um, and I'd never noticed it before. Uh, mm. And then I looked down, and it, it was sort of tremor, not not 
sort of massively, but it was shaking. Yeah. Um, and I thought that's a little strange. And um, I gave it a couple of weeks because I thought it was just like a trap nerve somewhere, you know, just causing a bit of yeah, a bit of problems. Yeah. Yeah. Um and it didn't go away. Um, and, you know, I, I spoke to my wife at the time and I said, look, I'm, I've got this, um, my handshake and I can't seem to control it. So I went to the doctors, obviously, and um, explained the situation. And they sent me for a, um, she said, we'll send you for a scan. She said, I don't think it's anything to worry about, as they normally say. Yeah. Um, but we'll, we'll send you um, for some tests. Uh, obviously got blood tests done and then um, sent for a scan. Um, I remember just sitting in this this machine that just went round my head for about an hour, uh, really slowly kept going around around my head. Uh, that was at Sunderland. Um, and then I got called back. Uh, it must have been about a week and a half uh, afterwards. Um, and I got told. Uh, and you could have knocked us down with a feather. I mean, you know, I, I just didn't know how to take it. Um, it was, you know, I was, I was relatively young. I, you know, I'd, I'd always associated Parkinson's with later in life, you know, and um, I couldn't believe it. And I kept saying, are you sure? You know, I mean, this is, this is crazy. Um, but he said, yeah. And, um, you know, I had to go for some more tests and the, the make you sort of um, try and walk in a straight line down, down the corridor, the, 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 the sort of watching your body movement. Um, and I remember, you know, when I was doing that, he turned, the, the consultant turned around and says, you do realize that when you're walking, your right arm isn't moving anywhere near as much as your left. Um, and apparently, you know, that's where it affects me most now, down my right-hand side. So um, it was it was surreal, Si, if I'm honest. It was just like I was I was in a sort of nightmare. Yeah. So uh, how, how else does it um, affect you? I, I will say, I, I know, Paul, in, in, in real life, we met uh, through going to the football, um, having a drink together at half time where yeah. we analyze normally a poor performance. Of <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, uh, Paul is a big guy. Uh, it, it won't come across um, on camera. How, how tall are you, Paul? Six foot five. Six foot five. Right. So Paul is a big, a big unit. Um, and you, 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 I've, I knew last time I saw you, you just, um, you'd also, you're recovering from a fall. Mm. Uh, now I know with my condition, um, that was one of the first really serious factors was the uh, the loss of uh, power and control in my right side, especially my leg. My leg would just give way mm -hmm. and I would fall. And when I fell, there was no putting my hands out to stop. I would just, I would hit yeah. the floor. Um, so is, is that, is, it was, is that the same for you? Is that, is it, how, how did it re really start impacting you from that small tremor once you'd been diagnosed? Um, well, it took a long time, Si, if I'm honest, to get on the right medication, on the right dosage. Um, I had to go through months and months of going back and forwards to the uh, to the consultant, um, getting told, uh, you know, you're not on enough or you're on too much, um, you know, because they had to give me patches for restless legs because when I was going to bed on a night time, I couldn't settle. Um, and then obviously the, the, the sort of the dizziness, the tremors, the the, the muscle spasms, the 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 stiffness when you, you wake up on a morning, it's, it's all factored in. So, you know, they the had to get me on the right dosage of each different types of medication that I would need to take, um, which I didn't have a problem with. I knew at the end of the day I needed to take that medication in order to, you know, keep living some sort of uh, decent life. Um, but the falls, you know, the first time it happened was on the stairs. Um, you know, one minute I'm walk, I'm just about to come down the stairs and next minute I'm at the bottom. Um, yeah, yeah. Luckily, I haven't had any serious injuries. Um, I've, I've yeah. done that twice now, four or three times, um, and I've ended up with a, a couple of cuts and bruises, but nothing, nothing serious. But that that fall last week I had while I was in the shower um, scared the crap out of me. If I'm honest, um, that was I think that's the first time that I've really been terrified of of what this illness can do if I'm not careful, um, because I've got. Um, you know, the fitted things in the shower for me to hold on to and things like that. But something happened that day in the shower where, you know, I just went um, and I tried grabbing the shower curtain. Everything came down on top of me. And like I said to you at the, when I seen you last, um, I thought that the bath tap had gone through through my back because I'd, I'd, the impact that I'd hit so hard, yeah. um, it was terrifying. Um, and it, I had this funny taste in my mouth and I honestly thought when I was going to sort of 
check to see. I, I thought that there was blood coming out of my mouth and I thought that's what I could taste, but it wasn't. I think it was yeah. just shock. Yeah. Um, but I'd hit the I'd hit the tap that hard. I'd knocked the hot tap on and pushed it to the side. Um, it took all my strength to pull the tap back in, so I knew how hard I must have hit it. Um, it's still sore now, but it, it was an impact injury. But it could have been so much worse. I, I, I kind of look back and I think, Christ, I could have banged my head. I could have broke my arms, my legs. I could yeah, have been knocked well, unconscious. Um, so I think that's yeah. the first time that, you know, since I've been diagnosed that that has really scared me because a couple of days later when I was on the way to pick the bairn up from school, I was driving my car and my eyes started going again. You know, just like it was really funny, just like waves in front of me where I yeah. couldn't see straight. So I had to pull over for 10 minutes till it passed. Um, now, it hasn't happened again since, but, you know, I'm, I'm due to see the consultant again next week and um, next month. So um, obviously I'll I'll be, uh, you know, explaining what happened. But that was the first time that it really terrified me. Yeah. Shit, man. Um, see, it, it sounds, uh, all these things sound so similar to the, to the disease I've got, cervical myelopathy, and to Branda when he he was uh, yeah his his um, his illness progressive. I really really re re relate to what you're saying. It's like uh, for me, it's uh, like I have a lot of fear of falling, mm -hmm. but I've I've never really hurt myself that badly. I was I was kind of lucky before I got sick. I I trained in judo for a while and. I always like to think that I kind of trained my response so that whenever I did fall, it was like time slowed down and I would adjust my arms to the limited ability that I could. And then I would just fall. And then, you know, it was never, never that painful. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, I've developed like a real like, oh, no, I really don't want to fall kind of, mm -hmm. you know, fear, which, which I yeah. need to do with. Yeah, man. So, Brandon, do you do you know much about um, Parkinson's, the science behind it? Um, no, and I'm not gonna lie that I do. But, but yeah. my uh, my physiotherapist, he is a who I worked with for ten years. He specializes in Parkinson, so you know we we talked a lot about it, and he would give me context uh, for like physiotherapy relating to Parkinson. So you know, I, I have some touch bases, but but like you know. It, uh, it's fun, well not fun, but it's really cool to hear about the medication, like how how much you know how much it really has changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's yeah. only ten years ago that you know you get a diagnosis like that, and it's like your life is over. You know, mm -hmm. you're, you're gonna have a. I tell you what, life. lads. It, 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 what shocked me was just how many people around my age have it. Um, I I didn't yeah. realize mm -hmm. because, like I said earlier, I thought this was like a, an older age illness. Um, without being disrespectful, that I, I always had that in my head that it was always, yeah. you know, all the people that I'd known who'd who'd got Parkinson's. But when I started joining up with um, doing a lot of reading online about it and going through the forums and stuff like that, and then um, I, I used to go once a week to a, a Parkinson's group with um, people my age. Um, I should be going back to them really because I really enjoyed them, but I, I stopped going for a while. But um, amazed how how many people have got it around the, the 40, 40, 45 year old uh, age mark. Really yeah. surprised. Yeah. Tricky thing. Like I have a friend who is uh, uh, my age. She's uh, uh, he's recently been diagnosed with Parkinson's, but then it turns out that it isn't Parkinson's. It's like, uh, uh, it's like his my mitochondria isn't, uh, yeah working mm -hmm. properly because of some kind of you know uh, protein deficiencies yeah so i i do wonder like i know especially with ms it's like ms is just the word which is used to describe mm -hmm. like you know an external syndrome and um, you have myopathy yeah. you know it destroys the you know neuron tender thingies but with parkinson's i i don't really know uh what the physiological reasoning of it is it's Something to do with dopamine, isn't it? Like, it's the uh, dopamine levels, yeah. Um, yeah. Which is uh, which is the main medication I'm on. Um, and dopa. It's, it's, it's called codemil, codemil dopa or whatever. It's called benil dopa, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, I, it, but um, yeah, I take that quite quite a lot. Um, so is it, it is, is, it, it, is it brain related, Paul? Is it or, or is it spinal? Um, no, it's it's dopamine levels in your in your brain. I think it's brain. neurological. So it's. Uh, 
Um, and Do you that, need to uh, take more and more of it? Um, well, th- obviously, the, 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 I go every three months to to see the consultant, um, and you know they, they assess my medication every time I'm there. Um, yeah. So it, it's basically between me and the consultant. You know, I, I'll tell the consultant how I'm feeling or what's happened or if the tremors are any worse, etc. Um, you know, touch wood, I've been lucky in a way that it hasn't had to be adjusted for a while. Um, but it has concerned me, the, the, these little dizzy spells I've had uh, recently. Because yeah. um, I always worry if it's going to affect my driving and stuff like that and how long I've got left driving yeah. a car and um, things like that. But uh, they the have said, look, you, you can go on and live a reasonably decent life if the medication levels keep you right. Um, but obviously they can't guarantee that. You know, they just... Um, you know whether they've just said that to, to just keep my spirits up, I don't know, but I, I've accepted it now anyway, and it's just a case of um, kind of living each day as it comes, and, that, and that's yeah. that's that's why I started the the YouTube channel, you know. Yeah, yeah, mom. Very cool. So, is the um, you, you mentioned at Star Paul, I think you did as well, Brian, that the, the the diagnosis maybe 20 30 years ago would have been a much more like devastating uh mm. blow. Is is there like is there developing um like new medicines or new procedures that maybe um can one day eradicate it or completely control it or or reverse reversal any of any of the symptoms yeah what gives you hope yeah well yeah. i mean the, you know you read all the time about certain um breakthroughs in in science and um you know the, or the, this could be the way out of parkinson's and this this could help um to be honest, I'm not really holding out that anything's going to happen in my lifetime. I mean, you know, if if, if something does happen, fantastic. You know, they, they, then if it can help me or it can help uh, people after me, then fair enough. Um, you know, they're, I, I, they're always working on something. Um, but it, it does kind of inspire you when you think, like you've just said there, Sai, how, how you know, 30 years is, is a long time uh, in certain things, but 30 years in, in medication isn't. Um, you know, it's come a long way. Uh, and, you know, the people that I've talked to and, and been involved with who've, who've got the, the illness as well, um, they're living a decent life. Obviously, the, you know, certain things, certain aspects of life that they can't do, i.e., you know, work, you know, because, you know, stress and, um, you know, you wake up every morning in pain, it's very hard to get going. And, um, you know, I understand that. Um, but I, I didn't want to accept that I couldn't do anything. I wanted to to do something and try and um, try and earn a bit of money and 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 and, and feel like I'm doing something. Yeah. Um, so I kind of look at that and I think, right, well, you know, when they were diagnosed all that all, the, all those years ago, it was it was like, right, you just don't know what's going to happen from one day to the next, and um, it restricted you a lot. Um, because if you look at the way Muhammad Ali ended up, it restricted his lifestyle and what he could do, you know, badly. Um, but um, like I say, it's come on a long way since then, and medication seems to control a lot of the symptoms, not all of them, but quite a lot of them, which is which is a positive sign. Yeah. So how how did it um, how did it then uh, when when you were working after you first noticed or your colleague noticed that you were tremoring? Then going through getting the diagnosis, um, how did that then progress to you not being able to work? How, what and what was that transition period like? Awful. Um, I mean, I, I did go back once I was diagnosed. I, I, I did go back after a period of time, you know, off sick, just to sort of get my head around everything and and, tr- and try and um, try and accept it. But then the job itself, um, you know, like I say, on a morning. Uh, y- your muscles are extremely stiff. It takes quite a long time before you can you can get going. Um, the medication would make you feel quite drowsy sometimes and very fatigued. Uh, it still does. Um, you know, I-, I still find myself sleeping. You know, a couple of hours during the day just to recharge the batteries. Uh, y- you can't do that when you're at work, kind of thing. And um, uh, you know, d- stress levels. It- you know, if you feel a little bit stressed, it brings on all the symptoms. Um, you know, the, the, sometimes the blinding headaches that you get where you just need to put your head down for a while. Um, this, I remember being told that there was, um, it's, it's mm-hmm. called, um, it's called a coat hanger headache where it goes right up the back of your head and across your shoulders. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and you physically just cannot lift your head up when that, that, that's going on. It's it, it's mm. similar to a migraine, but it's obviously caused by the Parkinson's and it's uh, it's hell on earth. You know, yeah. you, sometimes it lasts a few days, sometimes it lasts an hour, but um, you just have to put your head down. So, you know, I am restricted in in in, in certain things, um, and I just have to accept that at the end of the day, it's had a big impact. But um, you know, as time goes by, you kind of work out what you can and what you can't do. Uh, mm. And you know, I've had a lot of help from my family with that. Um, you know, my current fiance, you know, as soon as she met me, she was, she was reading up about it and it didn't bother her at all that I had the illness. She was just more bothered about learning about it. And, yeah. um, you know, but she's been a fantastic part of my life for the last two and a half years. She's uh, helped me grow even further. She's pushed me with the YouTube stuff. Um, and it's, it's, it's fantastic to have an influence like that in your life that doesn't let you feel like you're the odd one out if that makes sense doesn't make you feel like yeah. you're, you're not part of normal life because that's how I was feeling I was feeling <clears throat> excuse me I was feeling like you know I'm different to other people now and um yeah. Yeah. you know you guys yeah. may relate to that um yeah. but yeah she has been a big influence on making yeah. sure that I yeah. I continue to feel like I'm part of normality if you like and um yeah. and because she's pushed me so hard with the YouTube stuff you know now that I'm reasonably successful on there and it, it keeps growing um i've got to look uh, you know a lot to look forward to with that so um that's something that you I just put my mind to uh, and keeps me occupied now mm. um but having that influence in your life is very important i think because it doesn't let you get too down it doesn't let you sort of break away from reality and think oh i'm i'm, I'm now disabled i can't do this i can't do that i'm i'm not like anybody else and um it's a great feeling to know that you know somebody will stick by you like that. Yeah, at least I got a lady friend. That's that's yeah. <laughs> it's the meaning of life, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. So after after that, you weren't able to work. Um, what was that period like between you finishing work and starting YouTube? I've I've mentioned briefly um, on a, on a, on an early episode um, the um, brand as well. We've spoken about the. Sometimes there's certain undignified tests that you have mm. to go through to receive uh, benefits uh, to prove that you're not putting it on. All the, uh, oh. the just the awkward questions about um, wiping your, yourself after the toilet. And oh, all no. the, uh, did, did you go through all that as well, mate? Si, it was it was hell on earth. Um, I first, obviously, ESA wasn't too bad. Um, I was getting regular, but not it changed after a while and I'll, I'll sort of explain that it, it um esa i got when i was on the sick um and th there was never a, a problem with that it was when i applied for the pip um because obviously as you well know there's a higher level a lower level um yeah. so you can get more ability or whatever if you're on the higher level um i went for my first assessment uh and i felt like it was just a bunch of trick questions by some some guy sitting behind a desk who wasn't the thing is with that, they weren't qualified to, to understand what kind of illness you have. Uh, and this is my big bug bearer um, with these PIP assessments. And um, you know, I've, I've since joined various uh, various uh, causes to try and help disability people with these PIP assessments because they make you feel absolutely terrible about yourself. Yeah, and they they make you, know, you feel like you're not part yeah. of normality. Yeah. Um, and that's what really annoyed me. I, I felt like I was being, you know, trick questions were coming in left, right and centre. Um, you know, the thing is, when I first went in, I was openly honest about what I could and couldn't do. Um, yeah. And then when I got my first lot of results back, you know, when you get the, the points, um, the, the, the rank you're in points. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, the first one came back saying that um, I could basically work in a factory lifting boxes. Um, and I... And, and the reason for that was because I could bend down and pick my uh, carrier bag full of medication up when I went to show them what medication I was on. So yeah. because I was sitting in a seat and I picked my carrier bag up, I was then able to lift heavy boxes in the factory. Which I So obviously, I, I kicked off. I, I, I immediately um, you know, went to my doctor about it, and they said put, a, put an immediate appeal in for that. Um, so I had to go back for another assessment. Um, but while that other assessment was going on, I was then given the higher rate of PIP, yeah. uh, went for another assessment. They then took that higher rate back off me again. Um, 
they said that I was unable to work, but I wouldn't, I didn't qualify for the higher rate. Um, so I, I then had to wait for my next PIP assessment, which was about a year later. Um, and again, um, they came back with, I actually got less points than I got the, the second time I went on the appeal. Um, so I appealed again and I, I thought, right, I'm taking it all the way this time. I'm not, you know, Parkinson's isn't something that gets better a year later. It, you know, it's a progressively yeah. worse, it's, it's, it's a progressively worse illness as time goes on. Um, and I, you know, when I went in for that, the next PIP assessment, I was um, determined uh, that this appeal would go all the way. I was, I was, but it wasn't. I wasn't just saying I was fighting for me. I was fighting for everyone else in that situation. Um, I have a friend who has MS, uh, and he was really affected. He was in a wheelchair, uh, and they still didn't give him the higher rate. So I felt like I was, I was fighting for a lot of people, not just myself. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it was, it was when I went to the. Um, I, I then put another appeal into PIP, but during that time, I then had to go and have an ESA, ESA assessment. So what I did was, when What's I went that? to the, it's, it's um, Employment Support Allowance, yeah, sorry, we should mention yeah. for the people that want from the UK, uh, yeah. PIP, PIP is Personal Independent Payment, um, and ESA is Employment Support Allowance, is that right, Paul? Yes, yeah. yeah. So that's evaluating your capacity for work. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, uh, so, but the, the difference was when I went for the ESA assessment, it was actually with a doctor. Um, and we got 10 minutes into the assessment and he says, look, Mr. Ditchburn, he says, I'm stopping you there. He says, this, this, he says, this is pointless. Um, doing an assessment like this, you, you've got Parkinson's. I can clearly see that your mobility is affected by this. Um, he said, look, I'm not going to put you through another 50 minutes of questions that don't need to be answered, quite frankly. Um, nice. And he said, I will, I'll put the report in um, and uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Now, that was about four years ago. Um, no, three years ago. Um, and about two weeks after that ESA appointment um, assessment, I got a letter from PIP saying that there was no need to appeal anymore. They were bunking me up to the, the highest of everything. Um, I was then able to get mobility. I was on the higher rate of PIP and I would be for the foreseeable future. Um, I think I don't have another assessment until next year, until 2023. So, um, you know, if they're still going to put me through one, I don't know. But on the ESA side of things, um, apparently I should have been put into a, a, a group that basically don't have to provide sick notes anymore for, for ESA. That You know, you, you have a terminal illness, therefore... Uh, there's a there's a separate group that you go into, and I got a back payment of eight thousand um, pound, mm. which was very nice at the time. Uh, helped me pay a few things off and and get, um, but it helped me get a few things around the house that I needed. To, you know, like a second banister rail and stuff mm. like that to to, to help me. Um, so since then, you know, again, touch wood, I've had the higher rate of everything, and you know. Obviously, that should continue because it certainly got no better. Mm. If anything, it's mm. it's got worse. So um, that'll be interesting when I have to go for for more assessments. But the way they treat, you know, the disabled having to go through that is is an absolute. It's a lunacy, in my opinion. Uh, it, yeah. it it puts you down. It makes yeah. you feel irrelevant, um, and it makes you feel stupid as well. Um, yeah. Like you said, Sai, asking questions like that is is. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they should understand what certain illnesses are and what certain illnesses exactly, you can yeah. actually do in life yeah. with that illness. It's not like um, you're just trying to get a few uh, weeks or months off work with a bad back, like you've, you've yeah. been diagnosed with Parkinson. Mm -hmm. And it, it, at a time, I, me and Brian have spoke about this before, at a time where you're just adjusting to this absolutely life-changing condition that you've got, which all messes your head up completely, Mm. Uh, and the, you're only able to do work and provide and um, pay your bills, then you have to face with someone who isn't a medical professional, who is just purposely there to try and not pay out, to, to try yeah. and pay the least amount of money that they have to. It's like a filter. Yeah. yeah. So, like, listen, I'm sure that they sit there under instruction from the government Yeah. to make sure that they, they, they do their very best to make sure that you don't get... A higher amount, uh, you know, they are set out from the start to make sure that they will put up yeah. every kind of defense they can to stop yeah. you getting the higher amount of money, um, no matter what illness it is. And it's it's criminal, if you ask me, it's it, absolutely it feels, criminal. Yeah, 
It was, I don't know how it's in England, but here we have a fairly good system. But still, there is that hindrance that you have to go through. You have to, like, you know, go through the humiliation and the classification. I, I thought that was, like, such a big part of it. it was, I came out of it, like, really confused because, like, you know, I'd always felt like a, a, just a dude. Mm. Certainly, I'm a disabled person. Mm-hmm. Like, I have yeah. this huge stamp and... Then I need, you know, I need time. What does that mean? So I'm useless now. <laughs> well, yeah, but apparently, I mean, Sai, you might know this, but you know, the, the rumor has it that they they will watch you out the window, getting out of the car, walking into the building, leaving the building, seeing yeah. where you're going, just to try and catch you out. Now, yeah. fair enough. If there is people, and, and you know, we know there's people out there trying to pull your wool over people's eyes, and yeah. you know, like bad backs and things like that. People generally do have back problems, yeah. mm-hmm. but there is people who will pull the wool over your eyes, and, and that's just fact of life with everything. Yeah. However, yeah. you know, the the serious illnesses like you've got, Sai, like like you've got, Brandon. You know, it's 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 everybody. You know, and mm-hmm. and these are the illnesses that the, the, these people should be aware. We can't just make go away. Yeah. They can't disappear. We've got them for life, whether we like it or not. That's how, like, that's what Card's life has dealt us, and we have to move on. And we need help with shall that. We, shall we shift over to the opportunities? Because I'm, I'm really interested in like, like you, you doing your YouTube channel is a mm. perfect example. I mean, yeah. somebody who is, you know, before technology, you would have been screwed, like, you know, yeah. the, the two of us. But certainly now, you have, you know, all these opportunities which. Uh, I mean, they aren't affected by your Parkinson's, really, directly. No, and I, you know, I am lucky. I am very lucky, as you say, that um, this whole sort of uh, YouTuber and or content creator, whatever you want to call it, um, it is a job now. Many people have that as a job, and many people are very successful at it. Many people do it part time. Many people just do it as a hobby. But for yeah. me. I had to make a decision whether I was going to go full in steam ahead with it. You know, once it started picking up a little bit, I thought, right, you know, I can I can do it when I want. You know, so like you said there, it the Parkinson's doesn't affect me doing it because I can do it when I want, when I'm feeling like I want to do it. You know, if, yeah. if yeah. um most of my live shows go out on a night time. So, you know, if I'm if I'm feeling a bit drowsy during the day off the medication, I know I can take a, a little bit of a couple of hours sleep and I'll be okay for the night time. Um, if I record anything, I record it just when I'm feeling okay to do it. Um, so it, it doesn't yeah. restrict me in that manner at all, yeah. which is why, you know, yes, kind of in the lucky age of life where this has all come along and this is actually, you know, I think, Personally, I think a lot more people watch YouTube now than they do actually mainstream TV. Oh, uh, I agree there, hundred percent. Yeah. 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 Um, so so let's, I think let's go. Let's before we get into that, let's 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 because uh, we're going to move into the up, uplifting segment of the show. Yeah, uh, which we like to do. How <laughs> technologies uh, yeah. uh, and enable us to be able to do something that, like you say, twenty years ago wouldn't have been possible. Mm. You may have to just lie in bed, write, write, write a book, but now you're able to do this fantastic thing. And it's obviously around a passion that you love, football and your football club. So where, where did this first start? What got you started um, as a YouTuber? Well, weirdly, uh, it was watch. Obviously, you'll know who the true Geordie is, Sire, you know, Brian. He, um, I used to watch, I caught one of his videos um, and he was doing, um, it was a video of him doing a response to Joe Kinnear's interview uh, when he first got the job as Newcastle manager. And, um, you know, you know what Brian's like, he was very sort of, he was swearing his head off and things like that, but he was, he was really passionate and he, he was only doing it off his, you know, off his webcam on his laptop at the time. And I thought, you know what, I fancy doing that, you know, it just, um, and then I started watching a few of the YouTube channels about how to upload to YouTube, how to do this and that. Uh, and then I started just filming on, on my phone. Um, and, I, you know, I was getting like 20, 30 views on a video. It wasn't, it wasn't going anywhere. When, was um, it? When, was, when did this start? It must have been possibly 2018. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I hadn't really thought about doing it as a, as a, as a proper well as a proper or anything really it was just uh i felt like i was talking to myself half the time because no there was hardly any viewers you know yeah. um but then i started going on to other platforms of social media like twitter and and, and facebook and 
um, you know, promoting it on there uh, under the sort of, especially with Twitter, you know, you can you can put a hashtag on and uh, of new and UFC, and it would get this, a lot of people would get to see it, and then. Um, I was then starting to get a lot more subscribers, which I think I was just getting them because I was ranting a lot. I was complaining all the time. and um, But with me, any stage in my life, I've always worn my heart on my sleeve, whether it be football or personal life or whatever it is. I'm not I'm not frightened to show emotion. Um, and I've, I've always been like that. And I came across as that. But Brian gave me a lot of help because he watched... He used to give me a lot of tips on me videos. He, he used to you know message me and say, oh, you know, you need to be a bit sort of less monotone and pick you, you know, try and have speech a different way and things like that. And it was a massive help. Mm. And then all of a sudden, um, I think it was one game we got absolutely thumped and I went ballistic on the video. Uh, my subscribers went through the roof. Um, yes. Not at the stage they are now, but, uh, you know, once they started going up, I thought, oh, this, this is an opportunity here. <laughs> um, and, you know, you thought, I thought, there's a lot of there's a lot of other sort of football channels and Newcastle channels and that, but I've always been led to believe it's it's how you are in front of the camera. You know, if you just sit there and you talk in a monotone voice and you've got no personality, you're not going to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but then I started sort of bringing people on, and um, it wasn't until I started going live stream, I, which was about a year ago, nine months ago, I started doing live shows, uh, and now I've got like different live shows where I've got like fan forums and I've got um, transfer shows and all of this where I bring people on. Um, and it, it just took off from there. And now it's, it's like, as I say, I've just hit over 8,000 and I've got mods behind the scenes working in the chat. I've got people designing. I've got a sponsor on the channel. I've got people designing merchandise and it's just, nice. these are the things that I never thought of that could happen, but have come as an opportunity by doing YouTube. Mm -hmm. So how, how did that feel once, once, like, say, going from your first, do you know what I mean, handful of subscribers to then when you really started noticing it taking off when you were live streaming? How did that feel for you as someone who obviously started this off as just a hobby, just because you enjoyed football and you enjoyed ranting about football? Uh, how did that mm. feel for you? Did, it, oh, did you start thinking, wow, I could actually make a living, a decent living, and do something that I love? Um even though I have this illness, did that? Mm -hmm. What was that feeling like? Was that uplifting? I suppose. Oh God, yeah. I mean, it, it, I was just going to say that it gave me a massive lift and something that I haven't, that I hadn't felt in a long time. You know, I, I felt like I had a purpose that something was building. Um, and you know, it, it, it's a lot of people think that YouTube is just literally sitting in front of a camera and talking. It's it's nothing like that because there's a lot of planning goes into the live streams. You've got to have the right equipment, lighting, green screens, everything like that. If you, if you really want to go for it, um, you've also got to have that confidence in front of a camera because, you know, more and more people start watching, you know, it, it is like a live TV show. So you've got to make sure that you, you know, you're not going to fold or you're not going to just panic and something might go terribly wrong. Yeah. Um, but it's so uplifting. And especially I think for someone with a disability or an illness, for me, I'm very honest to my subscribers. They all know I suffer from Parkinson's. Um, I've done some Q and A's where I've been very openly honest with them. Uh, they've asked me all sorts of questions on it. And I feel like I can give something back now because they know that I've got this illness, but I see it as a, as a chance to show everybody that has got a terminal illness that, you know, if you can't go out to work or you can't do this, you can't do that. There is always something there that you yeah. can aspire to and, and have a bit of success with. And um, for me, I mean, you know, I love it. I absolutely love it. And it, it does give me a, a, a massive lift, side, if I'm honest, because, mm. you know, when you when you sort of go live and then you see how many people's watching and you think, bloody hell, you know, you, you're talking to, I mean, I had nearly a thousand people watching me show last night, which, you know, it's hitting them sort of numbers now on the live shows. And it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, and then you find yourself now, planning shows trying to come up with new content and you know people getting in touch wanting to sponsor your channel or coming on for interviews and it's it's bizarre and you know it's it's bizarre when i go to a football match now and people are asking for photos with us you know it's it's i've seen that very, happen i've actually yeah yeah I've, I've seen that happen at the match yeah it's it's so surreal um oh, but it gives you <laughs> <laughs> but it gives you a good feeling that you're doing yeah. something right and, and yeah. people are enjoying the content, which is all I want. You know, I always yeah. try and 
make my live streams a good laugh for everybody. You know, I'm a very, I've got a very sarcastic personality, but in a nice way. So I'll always, you know, have that sarcastic uh, relationship with people that make people laugh. That's what I want to do, make people laugh. And that's what my shows are all about. Yeah, sometimes I'm I'm serious on them, you know, when I'm doing sort of match reviews or stuff. Um, yeah. But other times I like to have a laugh and make people laugh. And that's, that's the sort of, uh, feedback that I've had is that people like watching, they have a good laugh and it takes them out of reality. And the good thing for me was, guys, when the, the lockdown was on, um, I got so many lovely messages from people who suffered from terrible mental health and depression and anxiety saying that it helped them get through that period. Now, for oh, me, nice. you know, knowing what I've been through to, to then help people through lockdown with mental health problems, yeah. it's just an unbelievable lift. It's awesome. That's great, man. Uh, have you encountered um, as and I know you have on on Twitter, but on YouTube, have you encountered any kind of trolls, any kind of backlash? What what has been um, as oh, yeah. any, any stumbling blocks along the way? Um, not with uh, not with YouTube. Um, I think you, you always get the odd comment in there, you know, in the comments, but you just delete them and block them off. Um, I'm. I, there is certain YouTube channels out there who think they're in a competition with everybody else. I don't. Um, I, I basically do it because I love it and I'm not bothered about anybody else. You know, I'll help anybody, you know, and um, I've got a great sort of, uh, I've met some wonderful, wonderful people through doing this. Um, one of them I sadly lost a couple of weeks ago, as you know, Si, um, uh, who was a co-host on my channel and um, he will be a huge miss. Um, Sorry, but, but the, everybody is, is sort of grouped together from the, from the channel, from the subscribers, from everybody else. Um, and, you know, it, for me, I'm now in a sort of coll collaboration with another Newcastle channel who I'm, you know, best mates with. He runs a, a, a sports channel, um, but we've gone into a partnership where we jump onto each other's channels. Um, and it's helping him a lot because a lot of my subscribers are now jumping across and subscribing to him as well. So we're sort of pushing each other's channels along. Um, but if anyone asks me for advice, I'm you know, I don't mind giving it. I'm not thinking, oh, I better not tell him that just in case he gets a bit successful. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm not like that at all. Um, and you know, as far as I'm concerned, if my subscribers keep going up, it's because I'm doing something right. And if every you know, if everybody else gets uh subscribers, then fair enough, good for them. You know, they're obviously yeah. putting some good content out. Um, mm. but I think for for people like us with disabilities to to just show people that we we can do something. We can be relevant um, yeah. rather than just sitting in a corner sulking about it, which I did early doors. I'll only admit to that, but um, I think everybody does that when the first we ran or something. said that in the past. Yeah, that's definitely a, a um, part of the adjustment stage, I think, part of the, uh, yeah. I, I almost want to say, a grieving period of um, yeah. things that you th think you can no longer do anymore mm, so definitely and, like, just mundane tasks that you that for me the, the the biggest the one was just being able to pick me son up um mm. can't now just have, just haven't got the strength in my right side and my back yeah. could give way um so it's about uh, yeah adjustment and then i mean i'm really lucky that my kids kind of understand um my youngest is is coming up 10 um but he's like my best mate though he knows um, he knows certainly about the diabetes, so he knows if my blood sugar goes low, he's got to get me a, a sugary drink or some chocolate or something like that. Um, he's very switched on with that. My two daughters are, um, you know, my, my eldest is nearly 20. She's, you know, she's an adult now. She's, uh, uh, she knows the situation. So does my other daughter, you know, and obviously I've got a little stepdaughter as well, Susan's uh, little girl. So um, they all know and they're all aware, uh, which I think helps a lot when you don't have that kind of, um, worry around you that you know that everybody's yeah. that doesn't know what to do, or if something happens, doesn't know who to call or or sort it out basically. And uh, but you mentioned the trolls before, Simon. I think people, I think in any walk of life, I think when you get a little bit successful, that's when they target you, uh, mm. because they hate it. Um, you know, I've had some awful things happen to me on Twitter in the last 12 months because of. Uh, people being jealous or people not liking who I'm associating with. Um, it, it's crazy. Um, you know, people making fake accounts up and um, sending messages pretending to be you. 
you know, it, it's mental. It is absolutely yeah. mental. And and it did get to me last year, I must admit. It did get to me, and I was going to pull the plug on everything because I thought it's just not worth it. I was, you know, stressed out. It was making me terribly ill. Um, but again, I got a phone call from Peter Beardsley. Um, For those who don't know Peter Beardsley, he um, is one of the icons of, uh, football in the UK, or one of the best who ever did it, uh, and mm. he's also uh, an ex-player for our team and from our yeah. area. Yeah, he gave me a ring. Oh. Um, I mean, he, he, he um, it's I don't know. He says he's not on social media, but he knew the the, the stuff that I was going through, um, yeah. and it was surreal. You know, one of my idols. You know, sort of through the eighties when I first went as a kid to Newcastle United, for, and he rang me and. Um, you know, spent about half an hour on the phone talking to me about, you know, how to overcome the abuse and how to just forget it, just block them and move on and just concentrate wow. on the people that mattered in your life. Um, yeah. And yeah. to this day, he still texts me now. Uh, you know, he watches all the shows I do and um, it's an absolute honour, really. You know what I mean? And, and then yeah. just for him just to say, just to drop a text and say, great show tonight, kiddo, um, and all of this, it's just amazing. Uh, so it kind of makes you, you know, on Twitter, you, I, I just block them. You know, they'll always be their site. They will always yeah. be there. They will not go away. Um, but you kind of success. Yeah, yeah you, exactly. you kind of live rent free in their heads because they've got nothing else in their lives good to deal with. Um, yeah, you know, I can't and, wait to get trolls for us. Yeah, it'll happen. Bring, bring it'll bring happen. It on. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, I've learned a lot in the space of, what, six, seven months with uh, how to handle the online abuse. You know, it's just a case of out of sight, out of mind for me. If they want to, yeah. you know, if they want to sort of uh, make fun of me or whatever it is behind my back and call me all sorts of names, fair enough. The people that count in my life, i.e. all my subscribers, uh, my family, my friends, they all know the type of person I am. They all know what rubbish is spouted on on, on Twitter. It's not just me that gets it. It's many, many yeah. other people. Um, so you know, they can get on with it because at the end of the day, um, something will happen in their lives where they actually need help and they're going to have nobody to turn to. Um, yeah. that, that's the way I look at it. So, uh, just let them get on with it. Um, they've obviously well, got nothing better to do. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, really mean? glad that you didn't give up, mate. Um, and that you went on to show them. Um, and obviously, your numbers are just going through the roof. Uh, so on that note, what, what, what is your your future plans? Do you have any um, goals, not just with YouTube, but um, what 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 do you want to do? Is there anything else you want to achieve in the in the future? Um, right now, I'm just concentrating on what on on, on what I'm doing on YouTube. So, I, if if an opportunity came in the future to expand within media, I'd love to do that. Um, you know, whether it be sort of, uh, I mean, my fiance always says, oh, you should be on a, a radio show or something like that, doing your, doing your own talk show kind of thing. I'd mm. love to do something like that. Um, there was one, one guy who really inspired me um, and who I watched a lot of before I started really getting into YouTube uh, full time. Uh, Craig Ferguson, he was a, uh, he's a Scottish talk show host. He used to do the Late Late Show in America uh, for around 10 years before James Corden took it over. Um, and I watched reruns. Hair on chicks. Yeah, yeah, he was brilliant with them, though. He was, he was That's brilliant. That's his gimmick, right? Yeah. yeah, it was his thing, you know. And yeah. um, But the way he interviewed people and, and his personality and his sense of humour was, was amazing. And that's why he always used to guess get guests coming back time after time because they loved being interviewed by him. The the, the loved the way he he he, he did things. Um and I watch uh, so many reruns of his because I just think it inspires me. It it makes me want to be like that, do like do things like that. And that's how I am in front of camera to be honest. I mean the the you know people that you know, comment on the shows and say, no, I've never laughed so much in my life. You know, you're hilarious and stuff like that. And, you know, maybe it'll lead to something, maybe it won't. But if, if this is it, if this is what I end up doing for however long God gives me, then that's fine. I'm, I'm perfectly happy with that, to be honest. But uh, if an opportunity arises within sort of media to do, you know, a radio talk show or something like that, then I'd, I'd love to do it. Excellent. I'd listen to it. Same here. And again, though, it would just prove that, it doesn't matter what illness you have. If you put your mind to it and you want something 
and you can achieve it. You know, it's it's um, you know, I know there's certain illnesses in life that that really restrict you and you you can't you can't do much, but there's always something that you can do. And I think um sometimes people with disabilities got a really bad rap because they're just expected just to sit there and, and rot away without trying to do anything in life. And um, I'm certainly not going to, you know, I, for, for yeah. me, I'm re- I'm representing, you know, disabled people as well as you guys are, you know, we, we do, at least we're doing something. We're out there showing that um, it doesn't matter. We're all yeah. the same at the end of the day. Yeah. In relation to that, it's always, I always feel like when I get compliments, it's always a bit weird because, you know, I, I kind of interpret them often like, I'm so impressed that you don't stay at home and do nothing. <laughs> you actually left yeah. your home and got dressed today. That's I know. Like, yeah, wow. some people are like, oh no. wow, you know, I didn't realize you could do that. But um, I think people, you know, for me, people have to understand what kind of illness you have, um, yeah. you know, and, and try and learn a bit more about it. I'm lucky because a lot of my friends, um, you know, that they've known a long time about the illness and the, the, they understand it as time goes by, they understand it better each each year that passes, I guess. But um, I think some people are very naive when it comes to disability. They say, oh, you're disabled, you've got a blue badge, you must be crippled or whatever it is. Yeah. It doesn't matter. You know, the, the fact of the matter is we're all, we're all the same. We all can do different things and we all have equalities, yeah. whether we're disabled or not. Um, you know, and, and, and that's something I've like learned to term. accept. Sorry, differently abled. I've yeah, kind of. I like that yeah. term. It's it's something I've every... learned to accept, and I think you know. I mean, when I've been talking to you, Sai, at the matches, you know, we just crack on like there's there's nothing wrong, you know, and yeah. it's it, that's how yeah. that's how I see it. Why can't we just be like everybody else? And uh, I get I get comments sometimes, you know, when I stick me blue badges in that, um, you know, people pull alongside us and think, well, there's nothing wrong with you. They can't. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they look at me and think, well, there's nothing wrong with them. Yeah. They don't know what's going on inside, which yeah. is, you know, a lot of pain sometimes. But you, I've learned that I just, I have to try and get on with things. You know, I have to, because I have kids as well. I want them to see, I want them to have yeah. a happy life, not worrying about me all the time. Um, yeah. And, you know, that's what's important to me is is, is making sure the kids have a, a, a decent life. And that's why... You know, I don't walk around as, you know, showing people too much that I have the illness. I want to, I guess, hiding it in a way, but not hiding it for the wrong reasons. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, it, yeah. You know, it, I'm, it's. I'm sure that's kind of a balanced thing. You, yeah. you got to like, you yeah. know, hide it to a point, but, you know, don't, don't, don't lie about it kind of. No, no. And I, I think I've always been honest with the kids and, and, I, and, and I always will be because I think they should. Yeah. They should be the first to know if, um, but they know when I'm not feeling very well. You know, if I if I'm having yeah. a bit of a bad day or I fall asleep in the chair, they'll just let me have the the sleep without waking me up because they know. So, um, yeah, nice. you know that, that that's a good understanding that they've got. But I just think for us to be doing stuff like we do, I think it's fantastic. And I think, but like I say, I feel like it's more of a a positive because it shows people that you can do it. You know, yeah. the, you know, no matter yeah. what pain you're in or what disability you have, um, you can try and do something. Even if you can't go out yeah. there and work, there's other things you can look at doing. Yeah. And I think it's really important to show that. Well, I can't think of a better place to uh, to leave it there and, and to wrap it up. Um, obviously, the, the, this podcast, it, it, we want to get that across. We want to uh, open conversations, open dialogue around disability. Um, I know a lot of people are can be afraid to ask questions um we 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 certainly want to be able to uh have that dialogue with people get people on like yourself who um again we really appreciate your uh, candid nature um and yeah. t- taking us through the dark side and also in, into the uplifting side so paul where can people if they are watching uh, or listening to us now where can they find you and your work mate uh, it's the the tune review on uh, on YouTube. Um, if you just search the tune review, you'll find it quite easily. Um, even if you're not a Newcastle United fan, but you want to have a a good laugh and interact with some fantastic people, um, you know, come and watch the shows. Uh, I do do pre recorded ones as well, but uh, I'm I'm live pretty much every day um, with different shows, and uh, there's some fantastic people come in the converse, join the conversation during the show. So. Uh, yeah, come and have a look, even if you're not a football fan. 
just to if you want to have a laugh, put a smile on your face, then uh, come and have a look. Brilliant. Well, we'll put all the links to uh, yeah. where you can catch up with Paul in the description. If you are listening to us um, on audio and on your chosen podcast platform, go to YouTube, search the Abnormies, and you can watch us in all, all our glorious uh, magnificence on screen. Alternatively, if you're watching us on YouTube and you want to listen to us in the car, you can go and find at the Abnormies on any good podcasting platform. Um, so please, guys, uh, if you could hit subscribe, hit like if you've enjoyed this. Once again, Paul, thank you very much for joining us on the Thanks. Thanks for having us. Um, and wishing you best, and hopefully the channel will continue to grow and your numbers will go through the roof, mate. Thanks very much, buddy. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone, and we will see you next time. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye.